Rider Ministries, a ministry where health, wealth, and wisdom prevails. Rider Ministries is an international ministry bringing healing, evangelism, and salvation to the nations of the world. Come be a part of this growing outreach where you too can learn to preach, teach, and heal in Jesus' name. Rider Ministries is a ministry that declares the kingdom of God is the power of God getting results. Now, here's Pastor Robert. Praise the Lord. How many are glad you're in church? Amen. How many are excited to hear the word already? I am. Amen. And so, we're going to give you our third session on, on God's covenant promises. And if you put these together and you meditate on what you're getting, you'll start realizing there's so much more that you really haven't touched on, but there's so much more that right now it should enliven you and get you excited. Amen. So let's thank God for this and let's pray and open up our message. Father God, we thank you for this amazing teaching that you've given us. We exalt you, Lord Jesus. We lift you high. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our teacher, for giving us revelation, knowledge, illumination, and comparison in the Word of God. And all the people God said, yes and amen and amen. So, and we'll get started. Only one is needed to bring the power of the covenant of God to work. Amen. So last session when we finished, we were discussing of the transference of spirits within the family unit. <coughs> now we will amplify the, the transferences and go to the fact that only one person is needed in a family to bring the power of the covenant to work in the entire family unit. To me, that, that should tell you, get excited for what God's going to do in the name of Jesus. Yeah. When you start realizing you might have three family members that are out to lunch and not doing what they know, but it only takes one. Awesome. It only takes one to fix that. Say, thank you, Lord. Yeah. That's why I'm saying only one is needed to bring the power of the covenant of God to work. Say, that is good news. Good. So we're going we're gonna to go for a walk, and we're going to look at the scriptures. We're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 8 through 28. Now, we're talking about transference of spirits and generational curses in this scripture reference. And if you pay attention, you can see how this stuff works. <coughs> All right. In the 30 and 8th year of Azariah, king of Judah, did Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reign over Israel and Samaria six months. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and his fathers had done, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Now, some of you may not understand, but Jeroboam became king shortly right after Israel, um, Solomon's son. Remember Solomon's son? Anybody remember his name? It sounds like Jeroboam. Okay. Yeah. All right. So... Then this person who was evil became a king, and he did evil. And from that moment on, you'll start realizing all of the people started doing the same things that he did. So it's transference. So I wanted you to bring this to your head. Okay. Who made Israel to sing. And Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him, smote him before the people, and slew him, and reigned in his stead. So here's a guy who murders a guy so he can become king. So you can see there's evil being transferred from one to the next. So you're starting to see this. And the rest of the acts of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the King of Israel. This was the word of the Lord, which he spake on Jehu, saying, Thy son shall sit on the throne of Israel unto the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the nine and thirtieth year of Uzziah, king of Judah, and he reigned a full month in Samaria. For Menahem, the son of Gedi, went up from Tirzah and came to Samaria and smote Shalom, the son of Jabesh, in Samaria and slew him and reigned in his stead. So we got another guy who murders the guy who murders the guy. Is you starting to see this? And the rest of the acts of Shalom and his conspiracy which he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles, king of Israel. Then Menahem smote Tipash, and all were therein, and the coast thereof, from Tis, because they opened not to him, therefore he smote it, 
and all the women there that were with child he ripped up. That's pretty evil. Okay? In the ninth and thirtieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, began Menahem, the son of Geda, to reign over Israel, and he reigned ten years in Samaria. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not of all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And Pul, the king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Pul a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. And Menahem exacted the money of Israel, even all the mighty men of wealth, of each man fifty shekels of silver to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. Okay? And the rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did, are they not written in the book of Chronicle, king of Israel? And Menahem slept with his father, and Pekahiah the son reigned in his stead. In the fiftieth year, Isaiah, king of Judah, king of the son of man, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned for two years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. But Pekah, the son of Ramallah, the captain of his, conspired against him and smote him in Samaria, in the palace of the king's house, with Argob and Ariah, and with him fifty men of the Gilalites, and he killed him and reigned in his room. And the rest of the acts of Pekahiah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel. And in the two and fiftieth year, Isaiah, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Ramah, reigned over Samaria and reigned twenty years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sons of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Are you starting to see this transference of spirits going down through this entire line? It's amazing. Okay? Now, let's move on. And we're, we're, we're talking about this, all right? So we need to understand. So in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1-5, through 5, we're going to see the sins of David with Bathsheba. Okay? And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And David sent messengers, took her. She came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned to her house. And when the woman conceived and sent and told David, I am with child. So we can see there's this transference, this evil stuff happening. Okay, so let's move on to 2 Samuel. Chapter 13, 1 and 2. David's son, Amnon, commits incest with his sister Tamar. Excuse me. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. Albeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Then Ammon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Ammon said unto her, Arise and be gone. So we can see that this stuff happens. You know, here's David, he's making problems, now his son's got problems. Can you see how this transference happens in the Old Testament? I hope you do it, all right? Now we're going to go over to 2 Samuel, chapter 16, 21 through 22. David's son, Absalom, commits adultery with his father's concubines. And Athrapel said unto Absalom, go in, go in unto thy father's concubines, which he hath left to keep the house. And all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. So we can see, see, we don't realize that, but until somebody like me tells you, there are transference of spirits. We're calling this stuff happening. Okay? 
Now let's go to 1 Kings chapter 11, 1 through 3. And Solomon with his 700 wives and 300 concubines. But King, you know what's worse than that? It's having all those mother-in-laws. All right, moving on. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, the women of the Moabites. Okay, Moabites, God hates the Moabites. Here he is having, marrying them. The Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zodians, and Hittites. All of the things that God said to kill them. And now he's marrying them. And he said not to. You remember that? Okay. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon clave unto these in love. Does that tell you something? I just wanted to bring this up out in this message. People fall short of the things of God and they call it, well, I'm in love. I don't have to obey anything because I am in love. The blinders come and you hear not the voice of the Lord because you're allowing an emotion to dictate your future. We sometimes call love is blind. Well, now you understand. So here's a man who knows better and yet does. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, interesting that it's brought up in the scriptures to show us. All right, let's move on. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Everybody say, your spirit went off the wrong direction. Okay, moving along. Is that helping anybody? All right, so here comes the good news. One person in the new covenant one person brings covenant to a family. This is so important. All right? So let's learn how God uses one person to straighten out the problem. Say thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, let's go over to Genesis uh, chapter 6, uh, 9, and then verse 18. So God brings covenant through Noah. All right? These are the generations of Noah. Noah was, was a just man, say righteous, just is righteous, just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. So you can say, hey, I'm walking with God. I'm righteous because of what Jesus has done for me. Praise the Lord. Can you all see that you're in the same line here with Noah? So that's good news. Okay. But with thee I will establish my covenant. God has established his covenant with us through Jesus. Amen. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Isn't that good news? Amen. That's what I thought too. Amen. All right, so let's move on. God's covenant through a believer in a house. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 13 through 17. God's covenant through a believer in a house. Everybody knows a house. It's talking about your full, uh, all the people that live in my house, or is it all the people of my last name in my house? Are you getting this? And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. Okay? But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us, what? To peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. So you can see, one person in the family can bring things about for good. Say, thank you, Jesus. All right. Now, we're going to move over to Proverbs in chapter 18 and 21. A person in covenant has the power to bless or curse. You are in covenant. You have the power. Okay? In Proverbs 18, verse 21, death 
and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Okay, let's go over to James, add to this, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor desires or lists. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of the birds, and of the serpents, and of the things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It's unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therefore, or therewith, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Now we're going to move over to Numbers, which follows up a person in the covenant has power to bless. In Numbers chapter 6, verse 23 through 27. Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise he shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So, when we do like Jesus does, here's something I want you to grasp onto. How many know that Jesus is the kindest and gentlest person ever? And we're to be like that. So if you're kind and gentle, then you're going to speak blessings like he blesses us. Say, thank you, Lord. So, how to relate to a family under covenant? How do you relate I'm a covenant person, but how do you relate this to other family members that may not be under the same thing you think? But how do you do this? And we're going to talk a little bit about it. But as you take time to meditate upon this question and ask the Holy Spirit, He'll give you the correct way with your attitude, of course your gratitude, your actions, your body language, and with your words. That's how the Holy Spirit will bring across a relationship under the covenant. Number one, I have four. Always respect the covenant, even when there's a differences in the home. So what's God's promises and his covenant for you? Make that priority number one. You respect the covenant. Even when somebody says, well, I don't believe like that, and I, I don't have this... What's the covenant say? Let me give you an example. There are many different kinds of denominations, right? But you can all agree upon salvation. So respect the covenant even though there's differences, okay? Number two. Always speak to the unity and the ability of God to move on behalf of each person in the covenant. So it's not me that's going to change you. It's God. 
because I respect God. God will do what he needs to do. Now, here's the hang up. Well, I want God to do it not right now. <laughs> I want God to do it right now. You know, we all want the Lord to do things right now. But here's the reason why it's not as quickly as you want. How long did it take you to change? How long did it take you to change from the way you were acting to the way you need to be? Was there years involved in there, or did it happen overnight? So what makes you think that all of a sudden, because that person, and you've noticed, expecting him to turn about? So here's the best part of this whole idea, is when you really, really believe in your heart that God will do this, it will happen really, right away. The change is, do I believe and trust God that he will do it? Say amen. amen. God knows how to give you a dream in the middle of the night. God knows how to give you a push and a shove. He knows how to direct you. But he loves you so much he'll let you fall and skin your knees. So you'll come running back to him. So don't get upset. So here you are. You're taking the unity and the ability of God to move on behalf of each person in the covenant. So my house is covenanted by God, even though we got people on the outside may not be walking that walk, but because I'm in the house, God is blessing it. Say, thank you, Lord. Can you remember when the Ark of the Covenant was stayed at this one guy's house, Obadan, whatever his name was, and God blessed everything the guy had? even though the ark belonged with King David over there in Jerusalem. So, uh, because of one person, you get your things changed. All right, number three. Never side with any divisive or destructive words spoken against the covenant, regardless of through, of through whom it may come. Okay. Destructive words... Oh, yeah, well, you know, God just doesn't always take care of me. Yeah, I don't get what I asked for. And you're coming against the covenant. Oh, well, you know, I don't believe in Jesus. You know, they're just coming against the covenant. Don't side with that. Don't try to be friendly. Don't try to, oh, let's compromise. No. This is what God's word says. This is what I'm going to do. If you're going to act out, that's up to you. I know God's going to take care of that situation, but this is where I'm at. You see, I'm just going to bring this up. I have made a decision in my mind. I will do what God asks me to do, regardless if there's a, another minister across the street who is well known on TV and everything. And I have made a decision that I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm going to preach a message. I have a, a meeting that I'm doing. I expect you to be here. But instead, they all run across the street. Then there's just a handful of people. Because of the distraction that somebody else is doing caused my people to run. Okay? I'm not going to take sides with that destructive maneuver. I'm going to do what God called me to do regardless if you're here or not. But if you're here, look at the blessing you'll get. See, because the Holy Spirit has blessed me to give you this information. Say, thank you, Jesus. And there are a lot of people who, oh, yeah, yeah, he's just a little guy, he's a little tiny church, doesn't know what he's doing, blah, blah. And that's coming against God's covenant. Whoa. Remember what happened when he didn't like the manna? Snakes came. God brought the snakes. It's interesting. So don't ever side with anything that's divisive or destructive against God's covenant. Amen. All right, number four. Here comes the best part. Exercise your authority in God's word to render powerless any words against the home. So somebody might say, well, they don't like because you got married to so-and-so and they're coming against your husband. Don't take sides, man. You just say, no, God and I are one in the name of Jesus. You're protecting the covenant with the word because you've been given authority to stand against the words that other people say in Jesus' name. So it's our responsibility to stop those words, okay? Let's go over to Isaiah 54 and verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. 
And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So God is saying, if you will stop the nasty words that are being spoken out against you, He has given you righteousness and a heritage. you got the authority from God to stop those words in the name of Jesus. Words are carriers of destruction. If they're used improperly, they'll cause problems with people. And it's so important to understand, a weapon is a word. And it says here, every tongue. How many of you have ever been chewed out by somebody and you felt like garbage when they were done? Those words hurt. They go right into your heart. They go right in and they'll cause problems. It's, it's the rampant right now. Kids are bullying other kids because they can get away with it. But the young person who got bullied and here's the word, kills himself. Or goes into our school and shoots a bunch of people looking for somebody because somebody said something and they're all angry about it. This is the part where the covenant of people, people would start realizing God's covenant works. So it's our responsibility when you hear words that are being spoken instead of talking to a person, just break the power of the words. Go into the bathroom. Go wherever you have to do. But say the words out loud and say, no, 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 that's not going to happen in the name of Jesus. There's one more thing we can do. It's in Psalm 64, verse 1 through 10. We have to stop the cutting words and return them back to the sender, according to the scripture. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from the fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying snares privily. They say, who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search both the inward thought of every one of them, and the heart is deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded, so they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. And, that, and all that see them shall flee away, and all men shall fear, and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and shall trust in Him. And all the upright in heart shall glory. Amen. And there's one more thing that we're going to end this message with, but it's still to be continued. But is in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 through 13. God's words are sharper than any other word. For the word of God is quick and powerful. Did you get that? Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So let me go over this. The Word of God is quick, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Some people make a mistake. They don't understand. The two-edged sword is words that come out of your mouth. They can sharpenly hurt you. But God's Word is stronger, more powerful, and sharper than anybody else's words. So when someone says something to you that's negative, decisive, you know, destructive, and hurt, God's Word is puts an end to that. My God is for me. And anyone who comes against the word of God, God will take care of that for me. I have an angel of the Lord standing beside me, strong and powerful. You sure you want to mess with that? Because he will stop 
So when you declare how powerful God's word is, just think about when you're turning the person and you're saying, you know, God loves you so much. And that word of God goes right into their heart. It divides right into the marrow. And, the, and they know without a shadow of a doubt that the word of God just hit them in the heart and, and let them know that he's the light. He's the truth. They know it because God's word is sharper. It's, it goes right in and pierces the soul. That means your mind, your will, and your emotion and separates that from your spirit. The Word of God does this. And even down the joints and marrow. So when you stop realizing, He goes right into the center. He goes to the root cause. God is able to fix this. And everything is being, is, God sees everything. There's nothing hidden. What you said, what you think, how you acted, what you did, it's all there. So here's the good thing. When you realize you're the one, and you can make a change in your family by your prayer, with your belief, and staying constant with God's covenant promises, you're a winner. Amen. How many of y'all know that you're a winner? Amen. Amen. So, the best part about this is, this is to be continued in <laughs> Jesus' name. Amen. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this awesome outpouring of your Holy Spirit, teaching us that those transferring spirits can be broken and stopped by one in the covenant of God. So when we have the authority and we speak, we break it, it's done. It doesn't come back, it's broken, it's done, it's over with, in Jesus' name. Regardless how we see them act out, what they say, what they do, we know it's destroyed and broken because we have the authority of God and God's word is stronger and more powerful than any other demonic spirit in Jesus' name. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory, Father, for the power of your covenant and all the people of God said, yes, yes and amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for watching and participating with Pastor Robert in this tremendous teaching. As you practice putting into place these biblical truths, you will develop your human spirit as a mighty believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm Pastor Robert with Writer Ministries. We're glad that you watched our latest video and we want to invite you to become a partner with our ministry. Partnerships mean that you pray one for another. We pray for you, you pray for us. You send us a seed offering, we'll send you a DVD. Our DVDs will help you to become ministers of God. And as a partner, we'll also notify you when we have our next healing explosions in your area. Or we'll let you know where they are so you can come and participate with us in Jesus' name. We want to teach you to become God's minister in healing the sick, casting out devils, the things that Jesus did. Amen. Our ministry is to help the body of Christ to grow and become what God has called each person to be in Jesus' name. So we're asking you to be part of our 250 partners this year. Let us know. So give us a call at 503-652-2650 or get on our website and check out rider.org. You'll be surprised of all the goodies we have on there just for you. So we thank you for being our partners. We invite you to come back and see us more often. God bless you. We invite you to join us again in learning God's Word with these awesome video teachings. You can visit us on the web for more of God's revelation and biblical truths at writer.org. That's writer.org. And join us again next time for more of Writer Ministries with Pastor Robert Ryder.